We're going to look this morning at verses 32 to 38 of Luke chapter 23. And I've titled it simply, They Crucified Him. They Crucified Him. There's a a Negro spiritual, which I'm resisting singing to you. The words are, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when God raised him from the dead? Sometimes I feel like shouting glory, glory, glory when I think how God raised him from the dead. Were you there? Well, the obvious answer is no. It was 2,000 years ago. But we're going there this morning. And by God's grace, I'm praying that as we look at what I hope is more than familiar to you, you too will begin to want to sing and to praise your name. I listened to a sermon by John Piper at the beginning of the week, and it was called Preaching and Singing. And he pointed out the link between preaching and singing. It's when the word of God settles in our hearts and minds through it being explained to us that our hearts are often set on fire singing God's praise. And it would be my desire today that I could leave this place singing God's praise. Even if I use words from an old spiritual song. Because our Lord did something absolutely incredible by dying on the cross at Calvary. Completely unique. There is no other religion like this in the world. We, therefore, who are Christians, need continual reminding of the privilege that is ours. I have three subheadings for you. First of all, quite plainly, Jesus Christ is crucified. Secondly, Jesus Christ intercedes. And thirdly, with great surprise, Jesus Christ is still condemned. Is still condemned. Jesus Christ is crucified. It says it in such plain, ordinary language that you could almost miss it. Verse 32, there were also two other criminals. No, you need to get that right. There were also two others, and then underline, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals. One on the right hand and the other on the left. Luke is making a point here. The others were criminals, he's not. (coughs) And they were crucified together on Calvary. So here the Lord of glory, the one who raised the dead, the one who spoke words of life, the one who brought the light of grace into the lives of many in his days is executed as a, a common criminal, though he's not. He's outside the city wall, symbolic in the Old Testament sacrifices as outside the the, the place of God's favor. Bearing in his body the judgment of God because as he's crucified, the Pharisees have achieved their goal. The Sanhedrin has reached what it wanted. He is to be lifted up from the earth, hung on a tree, and according to Deuteronomy, therefore, he himself is accursed under the judgment of God. But it's no accident. He's there because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit planned every detail of this before the foundation of the world. And that theme has to be grasped as you look at this this whole subject of the crucifixion. We are to look here not simply at the pain and the shame. There were both these things. He's so battered and bruised, he was unable to carry his cross. He's stripped naked, humiliated before the world. But those things, horrendous as they are, really are in second place to this great truth that he who knew no sin became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And from that same chapter, the great truth that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was in control with its wicked men's hands that are carrying out this brutal murder. 
It's the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth who has appointed this as the means whereby sin will be dealt with and sinners will be restored to fellowship with the living God. For all the horror, there's a positive outlook. Isaiah 53 has lots of details toward the end of the chapter after describing him bearing the sins of many. It says in verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. These are a description of being a victor, are they not? Because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's why I began with the end of Psalm 22. We're going to be looking at bits of it. But you must always remember that Psalm 22, though it describes with horrific detail what was to happen, comes to the conclusion that through what happened God's path of righteousness would be established and sin and would be forgiven and grace would be available for men and women it's always struck me as I read the New Testament how little detail is given to the actual physical act of crucifixion read the four gospels it's, it's very much a matter of fact thing there they crucified him you can go into books and you can delve into the gruesome details of how he would be spread out. A, a, a nail through the wrist or through the palms of his hand. A nail through the feet. And then hoisted up between heaven and earth to be laughed at as a punishment for a, and, 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 and suspended there in a horrific death. It's said that the person who was crucified died a thousand deaths. It was a murderous system devised by the Persians 600 years before, but which the Romans had taken and used effectually to keep people in control. They crucified people not only to kill the, the one they considered the criminal, but to warn anybody else, you rebel against <coughs> us and look what might happen to you. It was a horrific occasion. The person on the cross was in complete horror as they hung there to breathe what they had to do was lift themselves up because their lungs stopped working properly and to lift themselves up they had to pull on the nails they had to push on the nail that was below them and eventually on the cross you actually die from suffocation fluids build up in the lungs and you can't breathe it's a ghastly horrific way of dying now you see, I've begun to describe all the details that the Bible says, and there they crucified him. Horrific as it is, the significant part about the crucifixion is what it accomplished. And why God actually did it. 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. It was according to what God had planned, what God had purposed. These things are no accidents of time and space. They're not just the trumped up ideas of the Jews or the Romans. This is God's plan. God delivered him up. Peter tells the people on the day of Pentecost. Because it was his determined purpose and foreknown plan. I've mentioned Psalm 22. It's worth reading when you're thinking about crucifixion. Because there a thousand years before Christ was crucified, there is a horrendous description of crucifixion itself. Verse 15. My tongue clings to my jaws. You'll find it referred to in John 19.28. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 16 of Psalm 22 gives us details of the crucifixion, John 20, 25. Even the prophecy about the soldiers casting lots for his robes are there in Psalm 22 and verse 18. And so what you have on the cross is the Lord Jesus fulfilling the scriptures, fulfilling and carrying out what God had decreed as necessary to deliver men and women for, from sin. And as you look at the cross, maybe we should have a 
a little recognition of his pain. But what you and I need to do is to have a large recognition of why he needed to suffer such pain. And that was because of you. And that was because of me. God had told his people all the way down through the Old Testament that there needed to be an innocent victim sacrificed to deliver the guilty from sin or the guilty sinner must pay the penalty themselves. Right there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve have sinned, suddenly they're given a covering by God. We're not told great details, but it's generally concluded that some poor creature died, probably a lamb or a sheep, to give them the covering. Then the whole system of sacrifices begins. Abel's sacrifice, Cain's sacrifice was rejected because he was boasting of what he had accomplished. Abel's is accepted. Why? Because he brings a lamb of the flock. Stick your finger almost into any page in the Old Testament and you'll find stories about people like Isaac who's taken up on the mountain and about to be offered by his father when he's stopped and a ram is provided. Go into the time of the exodus from Egypt and you'll find there that before the Jews leave the land, a lamb has to be slain, its blood on the lintels of the door. They deserve to be judged, but this poor creature takes it their place and if they're under the blood, they're free. And then rehearse to yourself the sacrifices of the tabernacle and the temples. Every day at least two lambs died, morning and evening, nine in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon. And then when it came to special feasts, there was a river of blood flowing from the temple as the innocent takes the place of the guilty. Now as you look at these things, what are you to make of them? Listen to Jesus and take his advice. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures... For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are these which testify of me. The Bible, he says, the Old Testament in particular, talks about me, not only describing my peerless character, my great work, but describing the fact that I would die on the cross at Calvary. That is the purpose of God. John Calvin writes, We ought to consider the loftier purpose of God. For he determined that his son should be cast out of the city as unworthy of human intercourse. That he might admit us into his heavenly kingdom with the angels. He was cast out that we might be let in. And so Christians have understood this great truth in generation after generation. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law Galatians 3.13, having become a curse for us, having received in his body our punishment, there they crucified him. (laughs) Whatever you might think about the horror of the details, the reality is it was necessary for you and me. Hebrews 13.12, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Notice that? That he might sanctify, make holy, deliver from sin and judgment, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hallelujah. What a saviour. What an amazing saviour. Jesus is crucified that believers might find eternal life and ultimately be glorified. Because he died, we live. Because of our wickedness and rebellion, he took our place, made an atonement for us, and now has declared us to be children of God. If you're looking for something to ignite the fires of joy in your soul, this is it. Yes, it's a a moribund, somber occasion. And if you simply dwell on the pain and the shame and the humiliation and you revel as some so-called Christians do in, in, in the horror of it, all it will do is depress you because you'll be overwhelmed by the darkness of it. The shadow of the, the valley of the shadow of death will consume you. But if you can just get a glimpse of the fact that he loved me, he gave himself for who? For me, 
He loved me. Dear friends, Calvary screams out to us, you are loved by God if you're a child of God. Calvary calls upon us to respond, not with poor thing, but <coughs> hallelujah. Oh, what a saviour, says the hymn writer, that he died for me. Tarry here, dear friend, until this happens. Don't let this go. Don't leave this place with the same gloomy face you brought in, if you did. At this point, I could finish. There's enough here to feed your soul if you're a believer. That's why we have communion, don't we? We're to remember this as often as you do it. God's not a masochist. He's not, he's not delighting in, in, in physical pain and shame. He wants to tell you about his love. There was a young boy back in the 1690s who complained to his dad that the hymns of the church were too boring. It's not new, you see. 1690. So his dad said to him, if you think you can write better hymns, then why don't you? And so he did. His name was Isaac Watts. And some of the hymns he wrote are still with us when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My riches gain, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Oh, what a picture, is it not? If you're feeling bored, if you're feeling low, I challenge you afresh, dear Christian friend, get dug in here. Don't let this go until it, it, it ignites the fire of joy and love and, and, and service in your heart and mind. If you're not a Christian, of course you'll find nothing interesting here. They're not talking about Calvary again. <laughs> These folks, they're always talking about this. Why would they, they, they even consider it? Again, John Hel Piper helped me this week listening to him. I don't know if you listen to podcasts, it's amazing what's available out there. You just come straight in and you can listen to them. They're as fresh as the grass on the, the front lawn. And, 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 and Piper made this very helpful statement. He says, the reason some people can see the details of Christianity and not become Christians is they've never seen his beauty. All they can see is the blood and the gore and the pain. They've never seen his beauty. If you're a Christian, you see, you've seen his beauty, the light of God's grace, of the glory of Christ has shone in your heart. The unbeliever doesn't have that. And that's why the world says, oh yeah, seen that, move on. Christian, go back. Jesus Christ is crucified. And the one who crucified is crucified intercedes. Then Jesus said, verse 34, these are incredible words, aren't they? Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. I was greatly helped by a man called, is it Bishop Alford? I've got Alford down here. He writes like this, he says, As his blood was first shed for sin, he inaugurates his intercessional office by a prayer for his murderers. His teaching was now ended and his high priesthood begun. You see, the crown of thorns had shed blood. The whip had opened his back and you would be able to see his organs. The nails had pierced his hand. The nails had pierced his feet. And as that blood came out, an atonement has begun to be made. And through that atonement, there is now the power of forgiveness for all who will believe on him. And the New Testament, again, picks up this theme and runs with it. Colossians 1.4, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. Through whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood. That word blood is put there in the place of the idea of his, his sacrificial death. If we confess our sins, John tells us, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Therefore, let it be known to you, Paul preaches in Acts 13, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Acts 5, 31, Peter speaking, Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and saviour, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus dies on that cross to accomplish the forgiveness of the sins of his people so that not only does he take the wrath of God bearing upon him for their sin, he through his sacrifice releases them from their sin. You and I can remember the madness in our life. I always like Corrie ten Boom. Uh, somewhere it's just in the back of my mind when she has that illustration of she says that when God deals with your sin he buries it in the deepest part of the sea and he says no fishing trouble is we go fishing and maybe in a, a bleak day we'll remember all the terrible things what you need to remember is that as soon as Christ was on that cross he understood himself to be in the place of bringing forgiveness for your sins and for mine you and I have to understand from the scripture that we're all sinners. Now I hope I don't need to really dwell on this too long. Romans 3.23 All have sinned. All without exception have sinned. And in that they fall short of the glory of God. They miss God's standard. Back in Ecclesiastes For there is not a just man on earth. Wow. Not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes 5, sorry, 7, 20. There are some good people, but there's not a just man, not a righteous person who matches up to God's standard. Every one of us are condemned. And that's why Christ went to Calvary. The only man in history who has the legal authorities to declare time after time, this man has done no wrong. I find no sin in him. Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Not only physical death, but eternal death. But of the tree and of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis 2.17. It's foundational to the scriptures. And if I remember right in the Hebrews, it says in the day that you eat of it, dying you will die. It will be, a, a process will begin in your bodies which will result in you ceasing to breathe the air of this planet. But not only that, and it took hundreds of years for those patriarchs, didn't it? What happens as soon as you sin is you die in your relationship to God. You're out of touch with him. You're a rebel. When he says, walk this way, you say, who do you think you are to be telling me what to do? When he says, this is right and wrong, we say, who do you think you are to be deciding what's right and wrong? We live in a world full of rebels and it's become very popular in modern days, hasn't it? In, in previous generation it was sort of covered in the packaging of society. But nowadays it, they call it comedy when they stand up and blaspheme God's name and, and, and ridicule what is right and wrong. Anarchy is here and it will get worse. But through Jesus Christ sins are forgiven. 1 John 2.12, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Because of what he has done, because of what he accomplished, because he was innocent on that cross, forgiveness of sins is now available. And with the psalmist, or in Romans 4, we want to cry, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And one of the things I want to just pause here and emphasize to you, that the forgiveness in the Bible is not that wishy-washy cotton wool stuff that modern people talk about. Go on, forgive him. 
and then they expect you just to switch off whatever has gone wrong or whatever mischief has been caused. In the Bible, forgiveness is always at a cost. There's a price to be paid for forgiveness. God is holy. God is just. He can't pretend it's not happening. And so sin deserves judgment. Jesus understood himself to be dying on that cross as an atoning sacrifice, as an eternal, all-sufficient, completely adequate sacrifice so that there would be forgiveness for all who would come to him and repent and believe and accept him as the one who has paid the penalty that they might know and enjoy forgiveness. You see, forgiveness has two sides to it. It's provided, but it has to be received and embraced. It has to be received and accepted. Paul writes to the Ephesians, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins, of our sins, according to the riches of his grace. What is grace? That's where God deals with us. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new perspective. He he gives us the light of repentance. We turn from going down the mad, mad road to eternal hell and destruction and we cling to Christ and we claim his substitution as our own. God has made this provision and it's God who cries from the cross, Father. Please notice that word, Father. Jesus is where the Father wants him to be. Father. Jesus is where God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit have planned him to be. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's not an excuse. That's simply a recognition that human beings have have no real understanding of what sin is. For the Romans, it was a matter of convenience to kill him. For the Jews, well, he was a threat to their security and their their, their power. So they wanted rid of him. For the people, well, they're, they're flowing back and forward, aren't they? One minute they're shouting, hallelujah, and the next minute they're shouting, crucify. Just get rid of him. They don't know what they're doing. But God does. And through Christ, the penalty for sin was paid. Through Christ... The eternal God is bringing to fruition the way to deliver his people from sin and judgment. Psalm 86 verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy. But notice how it finishes. To all who, those who call upon you. God doesn't just write a blanket forgiveness for everybody. He conditions it on... There being a sacrifice to pay for it and for the individual then saying, yes, I want it. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for transgressors. Jesus Christ intercedes that believers might be forgiven. His sacrifice is enough to forgive us all. But can I underline again, only people who know the power of his forgiveness are those who repent and believe and thereby experience the power of it. God desires men and women to come and receive this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, 2 Peter 3, 9, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that anyone should perish but that all should come to repentance. But while God is not willing that any should perish, millions are. Why? Because sin has such a power and control on them, they're determined (coughs) to stay independent and pay their own penalty. You've met these kind of folks, haven't you? you? You go into the shop and if it's even something as simple as an ice cream, you say, I'll buy yours. And they say, no, 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 I'll buy my own. And as long as they persist in buying their own, they get no benefits. I'm not sure if it's the best illustration I've ever come up with, but the principle's there, isn't it? You see, God has provided salvation, and men and women say, no, 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 let me work this out for myself. 
Talk to unbelievers today. They all expect to God. They all expect God to understand how hard they've worked at being good. And how, how, how regretfully they did anything bad. And yet God has written on the pages of eternity this great truth. Sin must be atoned for. You need to be forgiven by me. And to be forgiven by me, you need to come in repentance and faith. And hallelujah to God's glory. The Savior actually brings it to pass. Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. There's a lot in there about God giving his son as a sacrifice, about David um, prophesying his coming. And it says in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, cut to the heart. The Spirit is convicting them, they're sinners. The Spirit is convicting them. God is righteous and they are not. The Spirit is convicting them. They deserve judgment. Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's how you know the Spirit's at work. Most folk don't give a, a hoot. And the answer is always the same. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh dear friends, if you're a Christian today, it's an awesome thing to be forgiven. (coughs) Yes, he loved me and he died for me, but he brought to me a, a whole new standing before God. His blood has blotted out the record. Hallelujah! His grace has put my sins as far away as the east is from the west. Stop and think for a minute. It's not hard, is it, to remember some mad foolish thing you've done in your life? Imagine if you got to heaven and God said, everything's forgiven except that. It would be horrible, wouldn't it? Because we know that one sin is one sin too many. Do you need... The grace of God. And then Christian, thank God from the depth of your heart for receiving it. Not a Christian, what can I say? That I, I, I'm caught in a dilemma here, you see. I know I have to explain these things to you, but I also know that unless God quickens you and stirs you, you'll go out of here as dead as you came in. I read in my notes last night about uh, an event in the, 1980, in the 1800s when... The American president, Andrew Jackson, issued a full pardon to a man named George Wilson. He had been sentenced to be hanged, but Wilson refused to accept the pardon. The Supreme Court then declared, The value of a pardon depends upon its acceptance. If it is refused, it is no longer a pardon. George Wilson must hang. And Wilson was hanged. Pardon was there. Pardon was his. He didn't want it. He didn't get the benefits of it. Oh dear friend, if you're not a Christian, come and look with me at this last section. For I believe, while there's great truths in what we've looked at, uh, from the the middle of verse 34 to 38 is an awful indictment against mankind. Jesus Christ is still condemned. Scorned by Jew and Gentile together. Like a horde of wolves, they're baying for his blood. They consider him to be an imposter. And if not an imposter, a disappointment. And then if not a disappointment, well, he's just a good laugh. I I pick that up all the way through Pilate. You see, when Pilate keeps asking about him being the king of Jews and sees him standing there beaten and bruised. Even if he's got that purple robe on that the soldiers gave him. Pilate looks at him and you can almost hear in his tone, are you the king of the Jews? And there's no doubt at all that that's exactly what's going on here. These people had heard him. These people knew people who had been helped by him. These people had watched the dignity with which he had endured this mistrial and this this travesty of judgment. The soldiers, well, it was just a job to them. And they divided his garments and cast his lots. 
John tells us they did this because there was one garment which was a single unit and couldn't be divided up. This was their sort of extra pay, their bonus for murdering somebody. So rather than tear it apart and just use the cloth, they decided to, to cast lots. But that was exactly what it said in Psalm 22 and verse 18, a thousand years beforehand. The one who committed no sin, nor had deceit in his mouth, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, says Peter. Or as the writer of Hebrews says, we have to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, and the next word's very important, endured the cross. Endured. He allowed this to happen to him for the salvation of his people. And men and women around him are, are judged by him. You have to remember this in this trial of Jesus. They all think they're trying Jesus when in fact he, Jesus in fact tries them. And exposes them in their nakedness and shame. Here he exposes the wickedness of the human heart. Psalm 22 verse 6 I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised by the people all those who see me ridicule me they shoot out the lip they shake the head saying he trusted in God let him rescue him let him deliver him since he delights in him ring any bells when I was doing this I wondered whether the leaders were deliberately quoting Psalm 22 at him at the end of verse 35. Look here, dear friends, with tears in your eyes as God exposes to us the hardness and wickedness of the hearts of human beings. The soldiers divided his garments. The people stood looking. Look at it in verse 35. If you read commentaries, the writers are in a bit of a twist about this one. They, 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 they are asking themselves, are these the same people that sang hallelujah and are they therefore just um, innocent bystanders? Or are they actually also, as it would seem to indicate, with the leaders sneering at Jesus? Incidentally, when Luke writes this gospel, he tells Theophilus he's writing down what many witnesses have told him. Here's your witnesses. They're watching. Some of them are going to be converted at Pentecost or just closely after. They saw all the details. They could see what these people were doing, sneering. Psalm 22, 17, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. But it's these rulers that really must make us sit up and squirm. They sneered. Literally it means turned up their noses at him. We're too good for him. He's no good to us. Who does he think he actually is? And then it seems they, they, they actually, by mocking him and sneering at him, seem to give a, an extra lift to the Roman soldiers. They also mocked him. Even as Jesus himself had predicted would happen in chapter 18 and verse 32. They also mocked him. And offering sour wine. Now again, this is an interesting thing. You see, that, that, that there's three different accounts of him being offered sour wine. Which again is predicted in Psalm 69 verse 21. But the picture here is probably that they lifted it up to him and just as it got to his lips, they pulled it away. Lifted it up, pulled it away. Look, he would like to drink, but he's not getting to. The scriptures do tell us that when it did touch his lips, he didn't drink. But the picture's possible, isn't it? A horrendous exp exposure of just ordinary people, as we might call them. They did nothing. And they may well themselves have been having a good time. I've never understood in ages past why a, a, an execution drew such crowds. But even in this land it did, didn't it? In my country, in the grass market in Edinburgh, when someone was to be executed, the place was packed. 
It's possible that's why they are there. The Jewish leaders, with their, their sneering, laughing at him, we've got him now, he's cursed of God, the people will pay no attention to him, and the Roman soldiers joining in. And yet, the title above him is clear. This is the king of the Jews. He's fighting a battle which he wins. He's in hand-to-hand -hand mortal combat with Satan, I might say. And he will break his power over humanity because he didn't defend himself, because he embraced all of this and he went there for you and for me. Jesus Christ is condemned like the worst of criminals and yet working to bring about salvation. Looking at this account, you, you can see why it is modern people are so hard to the gospel, aren't they? They're not different to this crowd. Some sneer. Some mock. Some just stand and watch. Why are they so hard? Were you ever like that? I was. It meant nothing to me that Jesus died. Until by the grace of God a new heart is given. Until by the grace of God we are drawn with cords of love. Until by the grace of God the shutters are removed and the light of his grace shines in. How can I explain it to you? I'm not saying these things to boast, by the way. I've stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I found out why we talk about a bird's eye view by standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. It was beautiful. The joke in our house is my comment at the point was it's dirty. But what I saw there you have to go for yourself and see. I've been on the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. I've looked down into the plains behind them, even though we were surrounded by blue bottles which were as big as bumblebees. Now I can tell you those things, and, and it might amuse you, but you can't see what I've seen unless you go there. visit to the Blue Mountains just to the west of Sydney. Now that was breathtaking. When you stand there with the three sisters on your left and the Aborigine playing his didgeridoo behind you and there is just a massive area in front of you. Trees and mountains. I've seen them but you will need to go and see them for yourself. That's the message of the gospel to every unbeliever isn't it? As Christians, we've seen him. You're familiar with this. He, he, he is the fairest of 10,000 to your soul. You love him because he first loved you. Your life has been transformed. You're found here on a Sunday morning. Your life is ordered by him. But for the unbeliever, we are talking about something that is just outside of their ability to comprehend unless God in his grace and glory comes and reveals this to you when they had come to the place called Calvary there they crucified him criminals on either side why would an innocent man die with criminals so that criminals like you and me might be in heaven hallelujah what a saviour were you there when they crucified my lord were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when God raised him from the dead? Sometimes I feel like shouting. Glory, glory, glory. And I think how God raised him from the dead. Amen. 